Yes, tonight we will learn how to carve the things that really count out of, out of ivory soap. I want all of you now to take your paring knife and to take a bar of ivory soap, which is 99 and 44, 100% pure. And there are very few of us who can say that. Take a bar of ivory soap and get ready tonight to carve something that matters. To carve out of that bar of ivory soap the symbol of your existence itself, friends. Yes, tonight we are going to approach head-on the meaning of existence and the meaning of reality. So we will give you all 15 or 20 seconds to get a bar of ivory soap and to get a paring knife and to be prepared to express yourself, to bring from within you that great, that great deep wellspring of humanity. And all of you out there who feel humanity welling up like a gigantic spring of existence within you, unexpressed and inexpressible, raise your hands. Very good, very good. And now, all of those of you who want to really say it, raise your hands too. Ha, 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 very good. Very good, my George. I can see that tonight is going to come. Yes. And under, under the way things really are and the way things always will be, there are very few of us who ever will be able to once again do it to WOR's fast program of public service, fast program of moving right out to do it for you. Will you not ever? John Gambling would never do this for you. WABC won't do it either, but I will. I'm going to give you a chance to say it, by George. Get that bar of soap out there. Get ready to carve 100 percent pure, 99 and 44, 100 percent pure. There's not much that's any better than that, is there really? I mean, stop complaining, will you? There's not much else you can say about it, after all. Now, you see? What happens? You get the chance in your chicken. You sit out there and you laugh. You snicker. You go through life writing stuff on signboards in the subway. Mentally. And here you got a chance to say it just once. So I got a cold. Okay. Don't you realize? Well, we, we know here at WO. As a matter of fact, yeah, I hate to tell you this, but I have noticed over the past five years that every time I get a cold, my rating goes up seven to eight points. It sounds sexy. Well, I have a deep suspicion, and actually I formed a whole theory about this, that many an infirmity has been parlayed into a major talent. Merely because a guy has a fantastic case of adenoids, he then becomes a sensitive actor. A flutter, you know. It's the flutter that does it. It's the crack in the voice at the emotional moment. It's like high cheekbones have often been the hallmark of the greatest hamlets. Can you imagine a short, fat hamlet with a heavy growth of beard? Who sweats profusely? Of course not. <laughs> Naturally not. Oh, yes, it's all putting itself together. You can't escape. It's like this one time I'm this kid, see? Because you learn these things very early in life. Very early. I think one of the great illusions today, though, among kids, and if I might say this, that, that kids recognize they got kid bodies. After all, what can a kid say when he's five feet two? I mean, he can't deny it when the old man is six feet seven. He's got a kid body. But there's hardly any kid that will recognize the fact that he's got a kid brain. In short, a kid head. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's where the confusion comes in. <laughs> oh, you're going to disagree? Let me tell you. <laughs> And there's nothing worse than a kid head, I'll tell you that. As a matter of fact, I can even go further than this, you know, and say, say that, uh, of course, one thing you'll find among kids, you'll find, among kids, you'll find the same things you find among people. You'll find slobs. You, you, you find, oh, yes, you'll find good guys, you'll find bad guys, you'll find liars, you'll find cheaters, you'll find the pious, you find them all. You see, they're all there. At the age of 12, they're all there with their little tracks held in their hot hands. Whatever it is that they're selling. You'll find bowling team captains 
already beginning to grow, eating, eating Fleischmann's yeast, trying to get rid of the pimples. But nevertheless, they're bowling team captains right down there in the soul. You will find culture hounds at the age of seven who, uh, who are standing in awe before Leonard Bernstein. With the, you know, it's all the way up and down the line. You see, it's, you just can't escape it. So here we sit. I'm, I'm, I'm a kid, you know. I'll never forget. See, I'll, I'll have to tell you, first of all, frankly, honestly, I was a slob kid. Which, no, 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 no. One thing you must admit about the mature man is that he knows where he stands. And uh, I was a slob kid. Now, like most slob kids, I grew up to be a slob adult. Now, the thing that separates me from the other slobs is apparently somewhere along the line, I've learned to recognize the fact that I am. Now, oh, yes, well, it's true, very true, that I cannot, I cannot deny it when occasionally, or well, more than occasionally, I will get these angry letters from little old ladies out in Staten Island with the aroma of shrafts still clinging to the stationery. And they will say, Mr. Shepard, will you please stop thumping on your head? That you, in spite of thumping on your head and singing the Sheik of Araby, you, you say these things that are very profound. My husband Charles says, cut out the head thumping and say the profound stuff and shut up. Signed an ex-listener, I love John Gambling. Well, now, I cannot deny this, madam. You see, that's the hallmark of the slob. He never knows where to stop. Like one time, I went on a, I went on a barbecued shrimp binge once. When I was 17 years old, you know, some kids get hooked on pot, other kids get hooked on records. I got hooked on barbecued shrimp. Well, every available scent that I had, I went, in, went into the shrimp market. I had discovered them, you see, on a date one night, that there was such a thing as barbecued shrimp. There was this chick I knew who dug shrimp. Well, around my house, seafood was, t was almost the equivalent of bugs. Insect world. Oh, I'm telling you the truth. The Midwestern household looks upon seafood as something that could be roughly described as, uh, what is the Midwestern word? Icky. That's a Midwestern word, or ug. Oh, ug. And uh, my mother used to say such things as, I'd rather eat spiders than shrimp. Apparently, she knew more about spiders. We had a lot more spiders around the house than shrimp, so she felt more at home with them, you see. So one night, I'm out on a state with this chick who was obviously a, a very hip type, you know. <laughs> it's the first time. Have you ever, you know, the one thing about the slob is that the, by the very nature of the slob world, he is only thrown into juxtaposition with other slobs. So he does not ever really realize that there is another world. And when he does see it, it's at a very long distance, and he puts it down. Very long distance. He'll walk past Lincoln Center, and oh, ah, yeah, bombs for crying out loud. He's on his way down to the big bowling dance, you know, that the Red Men or somebody are giving. So uh, he never really comes into contact with it. Now, the one thing about a kid, you can hardly see the slob kids can't tell the good kids, and the good kids can't tell the slobs. They're all kids. So one night, I had this date with this chick. I did not realize, of course, at that time that I was a slob. I just thought, you know, I was, I was a very good thinker and very sensitive. I did not realize that actually I was made out of solid neoprene, solid plastic. So I go out with this chick, and we, we finish the movie, and I, I think it's a great movie, you know. I'm digging it. I'm hollering. They're, they're swinging in the jungles, and they get the vines going, you know. And this chick is yawning like mad next to me, and she keeps laughing. And I'm all involved, you know. This uh, the, the monster is hanging on the top of the Empire State Building and swatting the spads down and the whole business. And finally we get out of the movie. And we, we walk about 20 feet, and she says, what a turkey. That is the worst thing I've ever seen, and I've taken her out on this, you know. And I says, yeah, <laughs> well, it was pretty bad, actually. <laughs> well, of course, I'm, I'm back paddling, you know. It's, it's wild. It's like, it's like a slob who really digs the Beverly Hillbillies, trying to explain it to one of his friends, you know, who digs Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> well, uh, actually, <laughs> yeah. Well, five minutes later, we're in this restaurant. And, of course, I'm going to pop for my usual ground chopped up beefsteak, hamburger. I'm going to pop for my usual hamburger, or possibly I might go all the way, because it is a big date, I might go all the way and get a ham sandwich, which, was I, which I thought was really high-tone restaurant eating. We never had ham sandwiches at home. That was a very high-tone thing. And some pumpkin pie or something. Well, the chick says, I will have shrimp. Shrimp. I said, what? She says, I will have shrimp. 
barbecued shrimp, I see, number seven. Oh, <laughs> I look at the side there, and it's a buck ninety-seven. Barbecued shrimp, you know, this is popping the whole thing right there for one whole shot. So I figured, all right, barbecued shrimp, okay. I said, oh, yes, very good, barbecued shrimp, very good. Uh, very good. Uh, I think I'll have barbecued shrimp, too. Very good, very good. Because by now I realized that I was in the presence of something I couldn't quite understand. Somehow there was another world that my mother didn't quite cover. I could see those spiders crawling around on the wall that my mother said were better than shrimp. And, you know, I'm ordering them. Well, the next, <laughs> next thing I know, the waiter comes up and the chick says to him, do you have, do you have, what kind of barbecue sauce is that on the shrimp? And she leans forward, she says, why don't you ask him? I didn't know they even had sauce on barbecued shrimp. What do you know, I sauce, moss? You know, to me, that was gravy. You know, you don't ask what kind of gravy on the shrimp. So she says, would you find out what kind of barbecue sauce that is? The guy finally comes over and I says, what kind of barbecue sauce do you have there? He says, barbecue sauce. What do you think? I says, well, uh, barbecue sauce. I said to, to, to this girl, whose name was Anita. By the way, it was the only date I ever had with this chick. It was a mutual agreement. And I, I says, it's barbecue sauce. She says, but does it have horseradish? And I says, horseradish? And he says, horseradish? No, it's barbecue. I didn't realize until 94 years later that she was ad-libbing. Well, so anyway, after a lot of argument, finally the shrimp arrives. Well, you know, you can't escape what you are. You really can't. You can pretend that you can, you can ad-lib it, you can fool around, you can make the scene. But when the shrimp arrived, I had never actually seen shrimp on a plate. I'm telling you the truth. Out here in the East, you know, everybody's so used to, to seafood, they say, oh, God. no, we never had shrimp. Just never had them. And here these little things came, the funny little things. And by George, they did look like spiders, you know, with this juice on them. <laughs> and, and, and the chick, you know, the chick has the little fork. She goes down with the thing and eats one of them, just pops it in her mouth. I didn't even know how to eat a one. I didn't know whether you peeled them or what, you know. Oh, I didn't know what you did with them. So I take the thing and I stick it in my mouth. I start chewing it. Of course, automatically I have a fantastic reaction. You know, the spider syndrome. Right away I'm breaking out in hives, tarantulas and all of it. I eat the first one. Down it goes. She says, these are very good. I say, yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm drinking all the water I can see for miles around. Off the next table I'm drinking the water. Just because I'm scared of shrimp, you know. I'm just scared, that's all. I'm scared. When you're scared, you always wash it down. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's the first thing that happens when you have a drink, but that's another story. So I reach out for the next shrimp. Well, I did not realize that you, you, you have to play shrimp pretty cool. You know, there isn't much to, a, to, a, to an order of shrimp. Well, I ate the shrimp like I eat hamburger. About three quick snicks of the little fork, and they're all gone. I just down real fast. That's another sign of panic. When the guy's eating his oysters, as fast as he can eat them, you know he's scared of them. He's got to get them down. So I'm eating the shrimp. I down all the shrimp, and, and this chick, Anita, is only on about her third shrimp. She says, you are a very fast eater. I says, but they're very good, you know. They're excellent. I might even order more. And I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to cover up the fantastic taste. I've never tasted anything like shrimp. I'm trying to cover it up with the French fries. You know, the rubber French fries that comes in these places. I'm eating the French fries, and I'm drinking the ketchup down with the water, the whole bit. Well, on the way home, I'm riding next to Taylor. It's fantastic silence, you know. She obviously noted me as a, as a slob. First of all, I was wearing a tinfoil tie. Well, well, I got it as a present. It was a present from my Aunt Glenn. It was a wide tie. that had a snail painted on it. And it was, it was tinfoil. It was, like, it was silver, see. And it was a beautiful tie. And, and, you know, I thought it was a beautiful tie, and, and I, I saw something in me, I, I some, somehow I recognized about halfway home that this tie was getting wider. It was getting like four feet wide. And I had this electric blue sport coat that I had gotten from this place, you know, where they have the gas pipe racks, which I was very good. It had, it had shoulders about seven feet wide, you know. And I was only about 15. I had shoulders about six inches wide, you know, the whole thing. It didn't work very So it drooped on each end. So... About halfway home, I began to realize that I was a fantastic lout. I was a slob, you know, a real rotten slob. And she's talking about books, and, you know, I'm, I'm deep in the big little book field, you know, and I, you can't, what are you going to do? You're going to talk about Popeye? 
you know, how you ever going to be so, you know? And, and, and so about halfway home, I realized it was a lost car. I was sinking. Speaking of sinking, this is W-O-R-A-M and F-M. So I, I, I was sinking. I was in the mud right up to my knees. You know, it was a quicksand is swallowing me. At, at about halfway home, oh, I'd say about halfway, I made a resolution to myself that I was going to stop being a slob and I was going to I was going to begin to investigate this other world because I felt that's the only way I could make it. I now, I, I realized, you know, strangely enough, I realized why there was a whole bunch of kids that had nothing to do with the whole bunch of kids I had to do with. And I was in between suddenly, which meant I wasn't a true slob, I guess, you know. I don't know. Maybe I was. I, I guess I wasn't a baptized slob. There are two kinds. There's the baptized and there's the slob that's won by, by birth. You know, that's another kind. And so I, I decided from that time on, there was, there was the shrimp scene. I was going to make the shrimp scene. So I went home. And the next morning I got up, I had about $4 in my life savings. And I invested it all in shrimp. In the next three days, I learned how to eat shrimp. I got hooked on shrimp. Now, I was not hooked on, I didn't realize until 400 years later, it wasn't shrimp I was hooked on. First, it was Anita. I was hooked on her. Well, secondly, it was her world, which was even more sinister. It was a world that I had never seen before, you know. I had never seen it through the geraniums in the window of the house I lived in. Bruner never ate shrimp, as far as I knew. And the only time I ever heard Bruner holler about eating was once in a while his, his old lady would holler out the window, It's time to eat! And Bruner would say, I ate! And that would be the total discussion of dinner. They never called it dinner. They called it eating. That was all. You just ate three times a day or maybe 20 times if you could get near the, the thing. You know, and that was about the end of it. Well, this whole new world, my language was terrible. Everything was terrible. I was used to calling movies, movies. It's a movie. And this chick kept calling it the cinema. She kept talking about going to the theater. She said, why don't we go to the theater next week? The theater, to me, that was the Orpheum, where they had, you know, Merle Oberon and all these people up there. That was the theater. And I, I didn't realize till we were on her front porch, she was talking about plays. I said, you mean plays like they, the seniors, the, the senior class play, Seven Keys to Ball Pate? And she says, no, I'm talking about the theater, not... I'm not talking about that idiotic Miss Bryfall going on. Well, well. I am not talking about Miss Bryfall going on those rotten things she does for the senior class. I am talking about the theater. Well, all I know is that I had a headache that lasted well in the spring. It hasn't entirely gone away. You never quite get out of it, you know. Every time I leave the Broadhurst, Instinctively, I am drawn towards Nedix instead of Sardis. Instinctively, the slob is still alive there. I go past these places where they have the gas pipe racks and those electric blue plaids. Instinctively, my eye brightens while I'm on my way to Brooks Brothers. Instinctively. Instinctively, seriously, I'm in this restaurant. I'm at the Four Seasons. And they give me this great big 17-page menu, the one that has, that has the French asparagus, the whole bit. Instinctively, I'm looking for French fries. I want an order of French fries. I want French fried onions and a hamburger, medium. You can't do it, you know. Instinctively, I am what I am. Instinctively. Instinctively, when I go to Lincoln Center, I develop a rash. About midway through the second movement, of the third selection on the program. A terrible rash, and I begin to itch instinctively. And it's, it's another funny thing that happens to me. About three-quarters of the way through the first act of a serious drama by Tennessee Williams, I am inflicted, and I don't know why this is, with an almost, well, it's almost spastic. I begin to yawn. I yawned once for 17 straight minutes with Geraldine Page in torment. 25 feet away from me. I'm just telling you the truth. And I was with this chick, and she says, will you stop that? I said, I can't stop it. What do you mean? Another yawn. I, I got so that I could even yawn through my ears. It's funny. I can yawn without even, even opening. I sit there completely with stone face, and I'm yawning fantastically inwardly. You just see a little watering of the eyes around the edges. And that means old Shep is feeling that buzzing sound again on the head. 
I mean, you know, and I'm sitting there pretending all along. Now, now, I, I must admit, you see, that. <laughs> but uh, I, I hope, I hope, are there any slobs out there with us tonight? Raise your hand. Great. Let's go out for French fries, huh? And let's go bowling, huh? I want to go bowling. I want to go to the diner over in Jersey. I want to drink the. I want to drink all the catch and beat the piccolo and holler and have a fist fight. I want to yell and fall off the stool. Do the whole bit. You hear that? Sing that out. You can't get loving where there ain't any love. You remember that, Salinger? You hear that? All right, George, this incessant search for love. I, I suspect that is the modern white whale. Love is a thing you search for with a harpoon. Uh, while we're on the subject of harpoons, is it warmed up, Ed? Oh, for heaven's sakes. This is Bob Hope with a reminder that you decide Show who off. wins the TV Guide Awards. The nation's viewers have made their nomination. I did hope Now it's honestly. time for the final vote. Get your ballot in the March 23rd issue of TV oh, Guide. That's very exciting. Vote for your favorites. Every TV American should announced vote. on my show Sunday, April of 14th. It is your duty as an American TV viewer to vote. Exercise your franchise. Kill Ben Casey. <laughs> well, let's see. I wonder if... Uh, hey, I wonder, uh, you TV viewers out there, do these various programs campaign? Seriously. Does Richard Chamberlain say, one moment, folks, from this operation, I'd like, to, I'd like to campaign here for just a moment and tell you what we here on Dr. Kildare stand for. When you're voting next week in the TV Guide election, I want you to remember that there is no bigger smile than mine. There is no wavier hair than mine on all of television in spite of what you think of my Harris. Or whether, what does my Harris promise you? I want you to listen to this, all of you. Listen seriously, shrimp eaters. You hear that? He's laying it down. Yeah. Oh, boy. In spades. All right, George. Let's <laughs> what else do we have here? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, <clears throat> Hey, do you think I sound interesting out there? Will one person call up, one person from out there in the darkness, and say, Mr. Shepard, that you have gained, in my estimation, at least 27 points in my stature rating by this strange new voice that you're affecting, which I first had thought was a, was a deficient field coil, and which then I thought later was a torn cone on my transistor radio, which I now realize is one of your physical infirmities. You don't think clean thoughts, Shepard. By the way, do you know that one of the great, one of the great medical organizations conducting research on colds has made a discovery that colds are parallel with and could very well be part and parcel with the phenomenon of thinking unclean thoughts? You know, we've never explored that side of medicine, have we? Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, I used to have an Aunt Mary who did. And whenever anybody came down with a pip, she'd say, They deserved it, ungodly people. You see, so she had, Hello, is there somebody on there? Oh, no, it's got to be a chick. It's got to be a chick. I'm sorry I'm not interested in you, Dad. Crying out loud. Beardless youth. Good Lord. Well, let's get on with the business here. We have uh, American heritage here. Ah! All right, let's see. Uh, Verdi's Othello. <laughs> Are you interested in radio technique? Ready? Are you in there? Well, I'll tell you one of the old techniques that was used for years on radio drama is the technique of the advancing forest fire. You want to hear the forest fire about to consume the hero? Listen. Stop it. I don't want to hear this crying. Yes, hello. Yes. Oh, yes, but I want you to also say that my voice somehow has a sinister effect on your libido. It doesn't? Oh, for crying out loud. You missed... Huh? It sounds a little... Well, I know that. I want to be reassured. Up. Uh, 
Oh, for crying out loud. That's the worst thing she could say to me. What a crummy chick. She says it sounds distinguished. That's like this chick looking into your eyes and saying, Well, Fred, I don't want you to get the wrong idea, but you're, well, you're a very nice person. Just remember that. That's the worst thing you can say. Very nice person. All right, let's go on with this. I want somebody to tell me that I'm dangerous, that I'm sinister, that I'm going straight to hell if I don't mend my ways. All right, let's get on here. We have uh, American heritage here, right? Oh, yes. If you don't know anything about American heritage, throw $1 in the envelope and send it off fast. And within a few weeks, you will know about American heritage. It is a magnificent magazine in book form. You know, they put hard covers around it, see? And it'll, it'll fulfill all those terrible yearnings you have for a great day that was, at least in history, but which never really was, but is only in the imagination of history buffs, okay? Like the Civil War isn't the way you thought it was, Civil War fans. Guys kept getting shot. I wonder whether a, a, a guy who was a private in the 3rd Pennsylvania Rifles would have the same feeling about the Civil War as Bruce Caton does. Or McKinley Cantor, for that matter. Just curious. Like, I obviously do not have the same feeling about the war as Daryl Zanuck has. Or Van Johnson. Maybe it was too close to me. What was that? Huh? Oh, no, no. Oh, is there a chair? Oh, very good. Very good. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. <laughs> hey, George. <laughs> what did you say? Oh, for crying out loud, they chicken out always at the end. Every time it's a lifelong problem. Great Scott. What a rotten thing. So, well, let's get back to the Mandarin House commercial here. We have Mandarin House. And if you're going to make the scene over the weekend here in New York, I would like to recommend highly a visit to the Mandarin House. There are two of them. One of them is on 13th Street in the heart of the village. <laughs> I keep thinking of the hip Orientals. It's between 6th and 7th. <laughs> and they have a bar. And it is, it is great Mandarin food, literally. And up on 2nd Avenue, just north of 57th Street, is the other Mandarin House, Mandarin East. Two nights ago, I'll tell you a little funny thing. Two nights ago, I had dinner up at, up at the Great Shanghai. You know, up on Broadway between 102nd and 103rd. And I was having a gigantic argument with somebody in the Great Shanghai, a very loud one. We went for 27 feet in the Great Shanghai. People in the booth kept saying, no, it can't be him. He's not that rotten. Well, you're wrong, I am. So I would suggest that you try the Mandarin House, okay? All right, let's see. What else do we have? Oh, they're open on the weekends. We have uh, another one, Paper Book Gallery. Speaking of the village scene, uh, for those of you who are masochists and also have a record player, I would like to suggest you make a selection from... Uh, Paper Book Gallery's vast collection of insanely rotten records. They have over 11,000 records that, as a matter of fact, some people say should have been uh, should have been outlawed just by aesthetic law, if no other law. And uh, if you would like to collect a few of these, you will find them down there. It's just 97 cents for one of them, and they'll let you take any other record in the house free. And they'll be glad to get it out of the place. There's a lot of space, you know. So uh, it's at 399 6th Avenue, just off... 8th Street in the village. Ah, ah, ah. Hello. Hello. Yes. No, no, I don't, I, I don't want, I, no, I'm through with the people. I don't want to have anything to do with people anymore. Stay out there on the outside. I, I'm perfectly happy here. I have made what we call in the psychological world a, a self-adjustment. And I am perfectly happy to remain here in this sealed compartment. And as long as you are happy to remain in Queens. Stay out in Queens. Don't bug me. All right, let's see. What else do we have here? Let's see. We have TV Guide. We've done Mandarin House, Paper Book Gallery, Ted. America. We're done, Ted. You hear that? No? What do you mean, no? Oh, Buick. Yes, I thought that's what that thing came on with. All right. When Buick introduced the Riviera ah. last fall, the public fell in love with this yeah, car. Yeah, you know the public. Rarely what? has a car become a classic so quickly. Very nervous people. And yet the most amazing thing about the Riviera, beyond its elegance and spectacular right. performance, mm. is its price. People have estimated that the this Riviera costs far more than it actually does. Even people in the auto industry mm, itself. Um, uh, if you don't know the price of the Riviera, 
you too will be amazed. The man to tell you is your Buick dealer. He has this car on hand and will take particular pride in putting it through its paces. He also has the good news that you can secure your Riviera without delay. You owe it to yourself to experience the perfect control and effortless maneuverability that are but a small part of driving the Riviera. Phone your Buick dealer this week and make an appointment to see and drive this great new car. See if you too don't agree that its price is indeed remarkable. Riviera by Buick. America's bid for a great new international <laughs> classic job. car. Pack half, Jeff. Hi, George. That guy sounded like he was carved out of solid margarine. You know that? Not even the high price spread. <laughs> hey, speaking of, of the, uh, the high price spread, have you noticed a sinister new development? Do you remember when the guys that had the margarine commercials on TV, they used to always refer snidely to the high price spread? You remember that? When they used to say, uh, it tastes almost as good as the high price spread. Well, that was when they were nervous. Well, then, after they got a little more, well, I suppose you might say self-confidence, they used to say, you can hardly tell it from the high price spread. Do you remember that? Now you know what the newest one comes on? It comes on and you can see this music being played behind the scene, see? And you see this ancient family sitting there, see? This lady with a high bun on the top of her head, and she's wearing long hoop skirts. And you see two little kids whose hair was cut with bowls, you know? And you see the old man sitting there with a great big handlebar mustache. And the camera dollies in on, guess what? A plate full of the high price spread. And it says, yes, friends, you modern, hard-hitting, hard-living, swinging, modern Americans who read Life magazine, that old-fashioned, rotten, high price spread was good enough for your poor old grandma. But now, the new plastic, homogenized, plastic, new, wonderful, whoopee, homogenized, vitamin D irradiated, new plastic, new, wonderful, whoopee spread is 20 times better because it's modern, right? <laughs> That's a classical example of George Orwell doublethink. It really is. In other words, a thing is made to be a substitute for another thing, and then after a few years, it is considered to be better than the thing that it substitutes for. That's true Orwellian doublethink. And so today, uh, I, I remember the other day I saw an ad for a sweater, and it says, Pure Virgin Nylon. I meant that for a fantastic bit of double. <laughs> And it says it will not it will not do all the things that all those other rotten things do that they make sweaters out of. Like moths won't eat it. it says. <laughs> and so in the end, of course, the, the, the substitute becomes far more uh, appealing than the thing for which it is substituted. Believe me, there are many people who believe zircons are fifty times better than diamonds because they're cheap. <laughs> And they're modern, you know. The, the idea, or well, another thing, too, of course, is that the idea that anything that is new today must be better than last year, in spite of the obvious evidence to the contrary. So some guy's driving around, and he's getting six miles to the gallon on the heap, and the doors rattle, but he knows it's better because it's a 63 model. He knows it. It is by definition. Seriously. It's, this is all part of the pop culture, you see. It's all, it's all part. And, and another thing, too... <laughs> Oh, we can go further and further. That part of that part of that concept, of course, has to involve another thing, and that is that the longer time passes, people think better. I'm quite sure that most people have the illusion that you think better than a guy, say, who lived 150 years ago. Everybody believes it, and yet our entire civilization is based on the thinking of guys who lived, say, like. 2,500 years ago, like, uh, well, for example, the, the whole Greek pantheon. Aristotle was a Greek, you know. He did not live in Staten Island. He was a Greek Greek. <laughs> and so was Plato, you know. <laughs> and yet we still have the illusion that if it's 63, obviously it's better than 59. Somehow. And yet the only thing that's changed is that your knee hurts more. That's really the only thing. that, And even the teenagers are older. 
That's the sneakiest thing of all, you know. <laughs> ah, you begin to get the idea that it's all a gigantic hoax. It's, a, it's an enormous, fantastic one-line gag. And guess what the one line is? <laughs> all of it. You know, I, I'll never forget. I'll never forget a friend of mine who went through about seven, seven, uh, well, as a matter of fact, as far as I know, when I finally parted company with him, he had taken his fourth graduate degree in philosophy. And it was getting worse all the time. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's the truth. He was getting more nervous as he went. And in fact, he had even taken one in divinity. That's the one that finally killed him. And I'll never forget one night coming around to his pad. He's tighter than a coot. And he's laying on that, he's laying flat out on the rug. He had a rug that his grandmother had made out of old scraps of, you know, socks and stuff, you know, those kind of woven rugs. He's laying flat out on it, and he'd been sick. And I says, Charlie, what's the matter? I mean, this guy was the doctor of everything. I says, Charlie, what's the matter? And he's, he's sobbing, saying, I says, Charlie, it's me, it's old Shep. What's the matter, Charlie? He says, Shep. I says, what, Charlie? Sometimes I wonder what it's all about. I quietly closed the door and went down to the hamburger stand. Had myself some piccalilli. I had myself some mustard. I had myself some celery tonic. And I just sat there. I listened to the jukebox. I popped my thumb. By the way, I'm very good at popping my thumb. Some night I'll pop my thumb for you. I can pop, I can pop with a three octave range. Oh yes, I'm very good. I had a friend, as a matter of fact, I had a friend who could pop his knuckles. He was fantastic. Semper Fidelis, he could play. In, in endlessly, endlessly beautiful variations. You never heard anything like it. His obbligato in the upper range was magnificent. Charlie, what's it all about? Well, I don't. This is WOR Radio, your station for news.